thank you for joining us today uh, for another round in our webinar series on investigations of biomedical issues and how they relate to human disease. Um, as a quick intro, Anabios is a unique contract research organization and a biotech company based in San Diego. We recover human organs from ethically consented donors and use the tissue or cells to conduct physiological assays in which we can test preclinical compounds for drug discovery projects. We've essentially redefined first in human and working with antibios is as close as you can get to a clinical trial without actually doing a clinical trial. I'd like to thank uh, uh, Gary Watkins, Director of Marketing at Antibios for putting together this webinar series. So with no further ado, it's my great pleasure to introduce today's speaker. Dr. Arthur Feldman is an internationally renowned cardiologist. He received his PhD from the University of Maryland and his MD from Louisiana State University School of Medicine. He did a postdoctoral fellowship with Dr. Saul Brusillo at Johns Hopkins University. He joined the faculty at Johns Hopkins as professor, assistant professor of medicine. He became professor of medicine and chief of cardiology at the University of Pittsburgh and subsequently professor and chair of medicine at Jefferson Medical College. Afterwards, he joined Temple University where he served as executive dean of the School of Medicine from 2011 to 2016 and where he currently has a faculty position as professor of medicine. Since 2016, he has focused on his laboratory's work full time and which efforts have led to the founding of the biotech Renova Corps, which is developing gene therapy approaches to monogenetic causes of heart failure. He has received numerous awards and accolades, including the Lifetime Achievement Award from the Heart Failure Society, the Distinguished Scientist Award from the American College of Cardiology. He has led several in clinical investigations of which three have resulted in an FDA approval. Today, Dr. Feldman will present on the role of BAG3 in dilated cardiomyopathy. We will have a question and answer session at the end of the talk. At that time, the chat box in the webinar panel will be open. Please type in your questions and I will read it aloud uh, for Dr. Feldman. So uh, please take it away, Dr. Feldman. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Good morning, everybody. Uh, this, is, um, this is a new experience for me. This is actually the uh, first webinar that I've, that I've ever done. And um, one of the problems is I, I love telling, telling a few jokes when I, uh, when I give a lecture. Uh, and so the problem is that you can't really see whether the people are laughing when you tell a joke on a webinar. So I actually asked my dog to come in and he's sitting here quietly. Um, and if he starts barking, um, then I, I know that we're, uh, that my jokes aren't going over very well. Anyway, I'm going to move on. Uh, I'm going to talk to you today. Uh, oh, this, these are my conflicts. So I'm a founder, director, and I have equity in uh, Renovacore Corporation, which is a, a preclinical stage biotechnology company. I'm going to talk to you today about, uh, I, I think that, that science is really a story. And, and I'm going to tell you about the um, uh, the story of how imperfect genes can negatively impact the heart and how maybe that we can we can fix it. And I'm going to focus on um, this incredibly interesting protein uh, that's called BCL2 associated anthanogen 3, or what we now call uh, BAG3. Let me first tell you a little bit about the history because I, I think it's uh, it's really interesting. So BAG3 is actually one of the oldest proteins that's known to scientists. It's found in um, every animal species in which it's ever been looked for, um, from man all the way down to, um, to fruit flies. And there, <clears throat> there are also homologs of BAG3 throughout the, um, throughout the plant kingdom. Um, it's expressed ubiquitously, uh, but it's most prevalent in the heart the skeletal muscle, the CNS, and in some cancers. And interestingly, as we'll see, um, we in cardiology really didn't start thinking about BAG3 until around, uh, around 2010 to 2012, whereas from almost day one after it was sequenced, um, the, the oncologists have, have been working with it actively. And the reason being is that, um, as we'll see in a couple of minutes, it, it has two major functions. 
one of which is to um, is to decrease apoptosis or to decrease program cell death and to uh, increase autophagy or the clearance out from the cell of, uh, of debris. And if you think about it, most cancers, uh, because they divide so quickly, they produce an incredible amount of debris, both in the, uh, in the nucleus and as well in the cytoplasm. And if, if they were continued to just produce that debris and to have all these misfolded proteins lying around within the cell, what would happen is that the cells would die. And so the cancer cells have managed to, um, to, uh, uh, to go after that problem by increasing the uh, amount of BAC3, and in so doing, they preserve the life of those cells and the cancers uh, survive. So in, in 1999, one of the, the major um, factors in, um, in apoptosis is a, a group of proteins called BCL2. And it's a whole family of proteins, some of which are pro-apoptosis uh, and some of which are anti-apoptosis. So the Reed Lab was trying to find additional members of that BCL2 family, and they screened a, um, a zebrafish library for, um, uh, for uh, genes that would bind to the BCL2 gene. And, and what they found was BAG3, actually BAG1. And then they went back in and they pulled out BAG2, BAG3, BAG4, and BAG5. And these proteins are very different and their localization in, in cells and tissues in the body is different, but they all share the singular um, uh, comp, com, comp, component part uh, of the protein, which is the BAG region. Now, how did this come to cardiology? Well, it came to cardiology in 2009 when um, uh, Dr. Selson reported uh, three families that had a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and then had severe um, neurologic disease. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about that in a second. Uh, the following year, 2010, uh, a group uh, led by Dr. Piyashi uh, found that, that BAG3 coupled the actin fibers to the Z disc. And then if you, if you broke that coupling or if you decreased BAG3, that the, the uh, contractile elements would simply uh, lose their, their uh, component parts and they would become disarrayed within the cell. Um, a, a year later, uh, Patrick Elner, Mass General, was doing a GWAS study in heart failure patients. And he found that there was, uh, there was a, a, a loc locus on chromosome 10 that, that linked with heart failure. And it was later found that that was in fact BAC3, but at the time he didn't recognize that, that particular protein. But really the seminal observation was made by Nolan Hershberger in 2009. I'm gonna show you a little bit of data from their study and then we reported in 2014 um, two findings. One was that, that people that had mutations in BAG3 had half the normal amount of BAG3 as people that didn't have mutations. And the second thing we found um, was that just general decreased left ventricular function was associated with a decrease in BAG3 by as much as 50%. So it looked almost identical to people that had the genetic defect. Um, just to sort of give you confirmation of the importance of BAG3, uh, these are actually four papers, all of which have come out in literally the past year. You can see that they all have 2020 or 2021 uh, dates associated with them. Uh, one in Nature Communications, one in circuit, two in Circulation, and one in circulation, uh, genomics, and uh, precision medicine. And these looked at upwards of, of 26,000 probands who had dilated cardiomyopathy, or even a larger um, representative population uh, or a reference population of 60,000 people. And in each case, what they found was that BAG3 is one of 12 genes that uh, can uh, that are attributable to the development of dilated cardiomyopathies when they have functional mutations. Uh, and I think the most, one of the most interesting papers uh, just was published 
two days ago, and that's the last one list, listed here, where um, investigators looked at um, the genetic and phenotypic uh, profile of women with paracardiomyopathy. And what they found was that a significant percentage of those women with paracardium cardiomyopathy had a pre had a, a predilection to dilated cardiomyopathy because they had functional mutations in different um, uh, in different proteins and and there were 12 proteins that they found of in, excuse me of importance three had the highest level of um, uh, of um, statistical significance. And that one of those three was, was BAC3. The most common mutation that's seen is in the protein Titan, uh, the abbreviations being TTN. Uh, and the Titan gene, if you look at a, a large group of people with um, presumed um, hereditary form of dilated cardiomyopathy, um, about 25% of them will have a Titan mutation uh, that's causative. Unfortunately, because Titan is the biggest gene um, in the human body, uh, it's one that, and the, the proteins can, uh, I'm sorry, the mutations can, can occur in one of 24 different uh, exons. It, it's, it's very difficult to uh, develop a, um, a rational strategy, uh, although a number of different labs are, are working on that now. Well, th this is the BCL2 um, protein. I'm sorry, this is the uh, BAG3 protein. And, and, it, and it's really a fascinating protein because it, it, it doesn't phosphorylate anything. It, it's so it's, um, and, and it's not a kinase and it's not an enzyme, yet it has all of these roles in the cell. And, and we believe that it has all of these roles by virtue of the fact that it's it's a docking station for proteins. So it can pull proteins together and, and allow them to act in concert um, and, and keep them uh, localized in different areas of, of the cell. So there, there, are three, there are five main protein protein binding regions. One is called the BAG region. The second is the PXXP region. Um, the third and fourth are these two IPV regions. Um, and the, the last is the WW region. And when we say IPV region, that's just an isoleucine proline valine uh, in uh, proteins in, in sequence. Well, the BAG region is really the workhorse of, the, um, of BAG3. And, and it, it does two things. First of all, it binds to an ATPase domain on heat shock protein 70. And through that, it acts to um, uh, it acts on the proteasome to um, degrade um, uh, misfolded proteins. Uh, in, in cancer cells, it, um, it uh, initiates metastasis and proliferation. And it binds BCL2. And in binding BCL2, it actually blocks apoptosis. So it's pro-autophagy and anti-apoptosis. Um, uh, whoops. Uh, I need to go back to that. Let's see how I can do this. Okay, um, the uh, PXXP region um, couples with um, a, a group of proteins that are called the dynein complex. And, and this is a, um, it's, you can sort of think of it as a conveyor belt that takes uh, misfolded proteins from the cytoplasm and directs them up to agrosomes, which are around the nucleus. And these perinuclear agrosomes take those misfolded proteins and either straighten them out or um, degrades them and takes them out of the cell. <clears throat> it also binds to uh, what are called SH3 domains, which are on a number of different proteins. But in, in, in aggregate, these different proteins function in migration, invasion, and in heat, adhesion of, uh, of cancer cells. The IPV regions bind to the small heat shock proteins, and they function in, in uh, an autophagy called macroautophagy. And macroautophagy is, uh, is a function that clears out uh, large organelles that are damaged. So for instance, if you have a, a mitochondria that's sitting in the, in the middle of a myocyte, and that, that mitochondria becomes damaged for some reason, 
um, rather than allowing it to sit and degrade within the cell and cause eventually the death of the cell, the macroautophagy system is able to take that protein and, or, I'm sorry, take that organelle and um, uh, digest it with lysosomal enzymes, degrade it, and take the, the degraded portions out of the cell or to be reused uh, within the cell itself. And then finally, the WW domain, we're not really sure what it does, but there's some thought that it binds to the protein uh, and, and causes it, the other tail of the protein and causes it to have its conformational, three-dimensional conformation. To date, this protein hasn't been uh, crystallized, so a lot of our, our, um, um, our understanding of its, um, its three-dimensional structure is really um, from computer, uh, computerization and, and, um, uh, and, uh, and, and comparison with, uh, with other proteins of similar size. Well, I told, I told you I'd tell you about two different diseases, and this is the first one. This, is, um, uh, this was found by Selson in, um, as I said, in 2009, reported in the Annals of Neurology. And he reported on three children that had a specific mutation uh, of BAG3, and it's called Pro209 Lu, and, or, Pro, or P209L. And what that simply means is that at amino acid 209 of the um, BAG3 protein, there's a shift from a proline to a leucine. And what that results in is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, giant axon disease, and respiratory failure. And these children have a, a, um, a, a phenotype that looks very similar to muscular dystrophy. And you can see that in, um, in this original paper, he described the mutation in BAG3 as causing severe dominant childhood muscular dystrophy. It really isn't muscular dystrophy. It is specific to, to BAG3. And this was our first understanding that, um, our first example that mutations in BAG3 could actually cause human disease. Sadly, these children um, actually died from um, respiratory failure because the severe muscle weakness is not in the cardiac muscle, but it's in the peripheral muscle. So what happens is they, they get respiratory failure because their intercostals and their diaphragmatics no longer work. And these pictures are just to show, if you look on the left, you can see the, um, the disorganization that occurs within the um, within the muscle fibers. And on the right, there are a number of different um, proteins that are, that are overexpressed in, in, these, um, in, these, in these children. So was, this, this area has become a, a, a major focus of interest in BAC3, more so than the dilated cardiomyopathy side. And I think the, the reason for that is that this is a disease that affects children. And so th there's actually a national organization now of the parents of kids with, uh, with BAG3, um, with a P209L mutation in BAG3. Um, but this is part of the controversy. So this was a study that was um, recently published by Ju Chen's lab at the University of California, San Diego. And what they did was they, they knocked in to a mouse model the, um, the, the um, BAG3 with the P209L mutation in it. And they knocked it into a, uh, into a uh, single allele. So they had heterozygote animals. And if you look um, in the, the, uh, the lower left-hand corner, you can see these are the hearts from plus mus. So these are wild type. Plus minus, these are, um, are hearts that are um, heterozygote for the mutation. And then the MM, which are hearts that are homozygote for the, the mutation. You can see that there's somewhat um, marked hypertrophy in, in the animals, but no dilatation whatsoever. So here's the normal, here's the, and, and here are the two with the mutation. And what's, you can also see that there's really no change 
between the heterozygotes and the homozygotes that you would ex expect to see with um, with a dilated cardiomyopathy. And over here, um, this is uh, some hemodynamics, and, and I, I won't go into this other than to just show point out to you that there's no change in fractional shortening, um, no change in fractional shortening, no change in LV um, uh, diastolic dimension, no change in systolic dimension. Basically, these are these are normal hearts, uh, other than the fact that they have some mild hypertrophy. And so um, the the title of this paper was B two two O nine L mutation of Act three does not cause cardiomyopathy in mice. It doesn't cause a dilated cardiomyopathy, but I think you can see a little bit of hypertrophy here. Um, but the major cause of, as I said, the major cause of this phenotype is from the, the skeletal muscle weakness and not from the cardiac weakness. And then these patients also have um, giant axon disease, but a, a very interesting finding was that you can change that, that the amino acid from natriproline to leucine, but you can change it to other amino acids and that each of the amino acids that you change it to can have a phenotype all of its own. So this is a, a proline to serine mutation, happened to be in a Chinese family, but it's been reported in, in Caucasian families as well. You can see that the, that the phenotype here is a phenotype of Charcot-Marie tooth disease. And so this is um, uh, a sural nerve biopsies, um, the uh, one on the right is the uh, is the normal. The one on the left is is from the patient with uh, with disease, and you can see you can see all this connective tissue in here, and and decreased size of the um, of the nerve fibers when when compared with the normal on the on the right. So a central nervous system disease predominantly in a patient with a bacteria mutation. Well, this is um, the study that really caused the cardiology community to sort of start to take note of BAC3. This was um, a study by Nadine Norton and um, Ray Hirschberger that was published uh, back in 2011. And they reported five separate families. And each of these families had a mutation of BAC3 that segregated with the phenotype. And um, in, in each one, well, in the majority of them, um, there was a uh, either an early stop code on or a large deletion such that one could expect to see a haplo insufficiency as a result of the um, of the mutation. And this slide just shows um, these are actually ten families uh, that were uh, ex that were suspected of having a mutation, and it turned out that they could see only. Um, only six of these, or I'm sorry, seven of these families had um, had uh, complete segregation of the disease. So, in other words, all the affected relatives in here had, were positive, um, and none of the unaffected um, uh, were were positive. So, this was the first sign that that mutations in Bag Three could actually have an impact on the development of a dilated cardiomyopathy. And you can see here that here's an early stop code on, an early stop code on. This is a large uh, deletion. And um, there's another early stop code on it there, in there as well. So after, after the Norton paper, um, people began to look for BAG3 in uh, populations with um, with dilated cardiomyopathy, and uh, here's a, here's a group of um, of studies that were published um, back somewhere between 2009, 2010, and 2014. And you can see that they're they're very small studies in terms of the total number of patients, um, but the percentage of probands these these were all studies of probands, so they were people with dilated cardiomyopathy the, of, of unknown etiology. And the percentage of, of those that had mutations in BAG3 ranged from, on the small side in the, in the Norton study, 2.5%, to 
and in the the larger group uh, i'm sorry it, on, on on the larger percentage was the canadian group that had 15 percent and interestingly the um the group that had the highest uh, percentage of probands having uh, a mutation in bag three was a group of uh, french canadians out in a community outside of quebec that was out at the end of a peninsula and the families in that region um, all spoke French, um, tended not to mix with, um, with the, the land-based um, population, tended to stay by themselves and to intermarry within their communities. And that's probably the explanation for the very high percentage of, of transmission of this disease in that, um, in that area. At the time, we um, proposed that about 35,000 patients existed in the US and about the same in Europe that had the disease. Uh, more recent data shows us that this is probably an underrepresentation and that there are probably about 70,000 people in the US and about 70,000 in Europe that um, have a dilated cardiomyopathy due to a mutation in, uh, in the BAC3 protein. Now, two years ago, in um, I guess three years ago now, uh, the European Genetics Cardiomyopathy Initiative published their data of over 100 families with, um, with BAG3 mutations. And, and this is the, where we get um, our, our best uh, information and our best uh, data from. Um, you can see the, uh, if you start on the left, this is the uh, distribution of, uh, of age in these patients. And you can see that the majority of them when they present is somewhere around uh, 20 to 30 years of age. Um, in fact, if you look at the average age that uh, people present who have uh, BAG3 mutations, it's 38. Um, interestingly, there's a, a very marked difference in, um, in survival in males as versus females. You can see that females have a much better survival rate than do, than do males. And um, that this, the curve that you see here, the, the dropping off of this Kaplan-Meier curve is really very steep. And, and this is unlike any that we've seen in any of the clinical trials that have gone on in the US over the past you know, five to 10 years. It, it's usually much flatter. And, and so the, the group um, proposed that the, once the, um, the disease is identified, that its course subsequent to that is, um, is markedly more aggressive than what they would see with somebody with a non back 3 mutation or somebody with, um, with more, the more common uh, ischemic uh, dilated, card, excuse me, dilated cardiomyopathy. And here you can see the, um, the aggressive course now, what's also really interesting is that you can see that 80% of the, of the deaths that occurred in people with heart failure were, um, were um, due to worsening heart failure, and that only 16% were sudden and presumably uh, arrhythmogenic. And this is very different from what we've seen over the years in the global heart failure population where about 50% are due to worsening heart failure and 50% are, are, um, are due to, uh, to a sudden cardiac death that's presumably arrhythmic. Uh, so again, it, it fits with this pattern of, a, uh, of an aggressive muscle disease um, rather than the, the more gradual uh, dilated cardiomyopathy that we see either post ischemia or uh, with other forms of, uh, of genetic uh, causes. Now, this is, um, I think, very interesting just because of some ongoing discussions in the, in the world of cardiology about ejection fractions. And, and um, some people want to do away with ejection fraction as a measurement, and others um, have now um, designated people with ejection fractions between 40 and 50% uh, as being a new form of dilated cardiomyopathy, dilated, it, the so-called hef MREF. Uh, so it's heart failure with, um, with a middle uh, level of uh, ejection fraction between 40 and 50%. So 
If you look at the table on the right, table two, these are the clinical characteristics of people who presented and were initially unaffected by a BAG3 mutation, but were found to have one. Uh, and they were being screened because they had first degree relatives who had been found to have a BAG3 mutation and who then did or did not develop a dilated cardiomyopathy. And so on the left, you see those with a normal phenotype after follow-up. And on the right, you see those that had a dilated cardiomyopathy after follow-up. And if you you look down to whoops, you look down to where um, to where ejection fraction is, um, the, the normal phenotype after follow-up group had an ejection fraction of, of 59%. The group that after um, uh, follow-up had a uh, dilated cardiomyopathy event, they had an ejection fraction of 58%. So you really couldn't tell a, a dif difference between the two groups. But if you looked at follow-up, one group had one group had an ejection fraction of um, of 56%. That was the group that had the normal phenotype on follow-up, and the other group had an ejection fraction of 45%. So I, I would I would propose that this middle group is really not a diagnostic group, but in fact is just a transition period between those that had a normal ejection fraction and over time, in this case because of a genetic mutation, were developing worsening heart failure. And that this ejection fraction, if we measured it sometime later, would actually be um, below 40%. So they would travel through that middle group on the way from one one uh, phenotype to another, but all because of the same disease, and that the middle group is in fact not a disease entity unto itself. So that's just a little, little political message uh, in the midst of talking about bag three. Okay, well, I, I told you that that I thought that every disease had a story, and so. Um, this is the story, this is my story and, and why I've been so interested in, in this mutation. Um, so in 1983, I was a uh, house officer at the, uh, at the Johns Hopkins Hospital. I was a second year uh, resident and uh, I was on a rotation in the CCU. And I cared for a, a young woman by the name of Lisa Berger who was uh, transferred to our service from um, a hospital in Pennsylvania, um, outside of outside of Philadelphia, I I, I think it was in in um, it, it was sort of up in the um, up in the the area of um, of Bethlehem, and she was she had a dilated cardiomyopathy. She was in um, heart failure. And she came down to us at Hopkins because uh, her doctors had heard that there was a new drug being tested that, that might be beneficial for her. Unfortunately, um, what we had was, was of no benefit and, and we, we were not doing heart transplants yet. We would start our heart failure program or our transplant program two years later. But at the time we weren't doing transplants, uh, there was really nobody near us that was doing transplants. And, and sadly, um, this young woman um, passed away in our, in our CCU one, one night. Um, and at the time, I knew that I was going to do cardiology, and I hadn't decided what area I was going to go into. But after seeing what happened to her, I really recognized that there was so little that was known about the failing heart that I felt that this would be um, be a great opportunity for um, for both uh, a research career as well as a, a clinical career. Um, at this, the same time, I got to know her doctor at um, Hopkins, who she had been referred to, and that was Dr. Kenneth Boffman, and, and um, he was running the the new heart failure program at Hopkins. And I decided that uh, I also wanted to spend as much time as, with him as possible. So um, I spent 12 months of my clinical part of my fellowship um, with Ken and um, really learned everything I know about medicine, I think, from, from him. 
Anyway, flash forward to 2002, and I met the, the woman, uh, the older woman seen in, in the middle here. And she had, her name is uh, Dorothy Weidman, and she was, um, was diagnosed by her physician as having a dilated cardiomyopathy. And when her physician was talking to her, he learned that she had a sister who had a dilated cardiomyopathy. She had two children who had dilated cardiomyopathies. And she had uh, a niece who had had a dilated cardiomyopathy and passed away. And um, I started working her up to try and identify what the mutation was that might have been um, in, in her family. And I traveled around Pennsylvania and New Jersey and met with um, as, as many of the, her family that would, that would see me, drew blood, did echocardiograms and, and physical examinations and then started uh, working in the laboratory to identify the gene. And back in 2002, remember the um, human genome had not yet been, been um, uh, completely sequenced. And, and because of that, to sequence a small, what, was, what would be considered a relatively small family, we only had bloods at the time from four affected individuals. Um, it, was, it was painstaking and, and quite, uh, quite difficult. Finally, in, um, in um, 2014 or 20, 2012, I guess, um, I got a call from a friend of mine at the University of Colorado, and he said, um, we have a patient here, and uh, you're genotyping his family. And it, it turned out that um, one of her first cousins had wound up in the hospital with acute heart failure. And while he was talking to his doctor, he told his doctor that the family was being worked up for familial dilated cardiomyopathy. And that somebody in Philadelphia, a doctor in Philadelphia had, um, had seen all the family members except his little part of the family that was living out in Colorado and taken blood and did all those other things. So he said, I'll try and find out what the name of the, of the doctor is. And, and my friend who was taking care of uh, him said, oh, don't worry about that. I know exactly who it is. And so my friend, whose name is Michael Bristow, called me up and said, um, you know, we've, we've got another patient for you. And it turned out that one of um, Mike's colleagues, a fellow named Matt Taylor, had just gotten a grant from the NIH where he could use the new Illuminas. Now, by this time, remember, the genome had been sequenced and they used Illumina equipment. And Matt had an Illumina and could run a whole exon or whole genome sequencing on the Illumina and do what we were trying to do for months and months and months, in fact, years, um, literally overnight or over a couple of days. So we sent everything out to, um, out to Matt and they sequenced uh, the, the DNA and almost immediately saw that there was a 10 nucleotide deletion um, in the, um, in the, in the third exon of, of BAG3, and it caused an early stop code on. So basically it cleaved off 125 amino acids from the, the at the BAG3 end of the end of the protein. And so it took most of the BAG region off as well. And we were the first to actually get tissue from um, one of these individuals with a with a mutation. And we found that as you see here, when you compared the controls with the um, with uh, the, um, oops. When you compare the controls with the um, with the patient's uh, uh, DNA, which is in the, uh, in, I'm sorry, with this a protein with the with the um, with the protein levels in the middle, uh, that there was hardly any bag three protein in in this heart when compared with control hearts. And here you can see the um, the um, pedigree for this. Um, for this family. This is the proban with, with the arrow right here. And if they told me that they had a, a niece um, who had uh, died of heart failure, and um, I wanted to get the chart because I, I'd either seen all these patients or my colleagues in Colorado had seen the patients that I hadn't seen. So somebody had, had put their eyes on each of these individuals and knew by, for a fact that if they had a dilated cardiomyopathy, they in fact had a dilated cardiomyopathy. So I asked the family to get this chart for me. 
and they got the chart and it was a Johns Hopkins Hospital chart, make a long story short. Uh, I found a note in there that was in my handwriting and it turns out that I had taken care of Lisa Berger in 1983. I was the resident, uh, as I said, in the CCU then. And um, she, was, uh, she was one of my patients. So when that happened, it, it, there was sort of this um, you know, sense of karma that uh, this was something that I really needed to, um, uh, to stick with. So the first thing we did was we looked at a whole host of models to see if this decrease in BAG3 that we saw in the failing human heart was in fact ubiquitous, and, and it was. So here's, um, here's our, our look at, um, oops, I don't know why this keeps doing this. Here's our look at uh, failing human heart. This, these are non-genetic forms. Um, and this is uh, below that is, is work from Europe, from uh, Spain, this is a study uh, by a fellow named Toro, who um, looked at um, a large group of uh, patients with uh, heart failure and found the same thing we did, which was that back three levels were reduced. In the middle, you can see a post-MI mouse model, post-MI pig model. Uh, in the upper right-hand corner is studies by um, the group out at UCSD. They looked at mice with uh, banding and um, mice with um, transaortic constriction of the aorta. Both cases, they found about a 50% reduction in BAG3. And then finally, in the bottom right-hand corner, we made a knockout mouse, a, a heterozygote knockout mouse. And you can see that, as we would have expected, a, a decrease in, in BAG3 expression. Now, the next thing we wanted to do was to determine whether we could um, whether we could figure out a, a good treatment for patients with uh, with BAG3 mutations. And we felt that the um, for those that had haploinsufficiency or half the number of BAG3 that we could uh, potentially use gene therapy because we could replace that the the, the amount of protein that was um, lost because of the loss of one, one allele um, with uh, exogenous um, protein. So this was one of the first studies we did. We took um, mice and we randomized them to either sham on the left or to, um, or to um, active, to sham or to, um, transaortic banding on the right. And then we took the sham mice and the transaortic banded mice and divided them into either getting uh, an adenovirus driving GFP, which was just a marker gene, or an adenovirus, uh, I, I'm sorry, an adeno-associated virus driving BAG3. And um, what we found was that if we, um, we looked at two different doses of, uh, of adeno-associated virus, and we found that that we've got the best results, at least in terms of protein expression, uh, when we use one times 10 to the 12th particles um, per animal. And then if you look in the bottom right-hand corner, you can see the results. So the green are animals that got transiotic constriction with um, no, um, um, no BAG3. The um, blue are the um, sham animals, which um, which received no treatment. The, um, the, the uh, dark green uh, with the upside down triangles are sham that received high dose BAG3. And then the red are the animals that received transaortic constriction, but where these arrows are at 10 weeks of age, when the ejection fraction had fallen, or in this case, the fractional shortening had fallen, there was an, a, a marked and dramatic increase in um, uh, fractional shortening within about 14 days of the, um, of the uh, injection. This was a uh, retroorbital injection, so it, it was a, uh, the same as a, a venous, uh, venous injection. And so this was, um, this was exciting. And um, the next thing we did was to see if we could uh, see the same um, the same effects if we look long term. And so here again, here we did basically the exact same experiment, but we just uh, carried it out a little bit longer and in a different set of mice, and we still saw that improvement in, in the ejection fraction. 
And then we decided to do a post MI mouse just to look at a at a different um, uh, cause of disease and see if we could see the same benefits. So in this case, we took again a group of mice and we randomized them to either sham and GFP, which is seen in the green, sham and bag three, which is seen in the yellow. And those two didn't change throughout the course of the trial. And then the blue and the red were both underwent a myocardial infarction. And then at eight weeks, we injected those mice with either um, with either BAG3 or with GFP. And you can see that in the red line, the group that got um, that got um, BAG3, there was this, a slow but substantial increase uh, in contractility over time. And if you look in the bottom right-hand corner, this is the summary of all the, um, each of those dots represents a um, an animal that was treated. And you can see that the uh, MI BAG3 group uh, almost completely reconstituted um, normal left ventricular function. So um, the next thing we wanted to do is to, um, and, and, and I'm sorry, so this just shows the, um, the, the reasons that we thought that the BAG3 gene therapy was, was working and would potentially work in, in, a, in a human. And, and that was that, first of all, the, um, the human BAG3 gene is not immunogenic because it's a, it's a human gene that we're putting back in. The um, adeno-associated adeno virus, uh, we started with um, actually using six, and then we switched to two nine. So it's, um, it's partially um, part of the virus is from two, and part of the virus is from an associated virus nine. We felt that it was less immunogenic, uh, certainly less immunogenic than an adenovirus, and that it had a very good transduction efficiency. Importantly, the, vir the vector is non-integrative, and, and what that simply means is that the, um, the virus gets into the nucleus but it doesn't get into the chromosome. And because of that, it can't be an oncogene. Now, I think that the common belief is that the, there's always that possibility that a single virus in a single cell could actually get into the, into the, um, um, into the, be incorporated into the, um, into the genome, but it would just be a single cell and um, the chances that that could develop into a, a, into a tumor is, um, we believe, um, small, but there's certainly that theoretical risk. And because of that, any patients uh, that are getting gene therapy with an AAV virus um, are, in fact, going to be watched very carefully, literally, for the, for the rest of their lives, um, meeting all of the uh, criteria that have been established by the American Cancer Society for um, uh, for monitoring. Um, initially, we were going to use a troponin promoter. We've now um, uh, moved to a different promoter uh, because we found that uh, over time, the troponin promoter just wasn't uh, as uh, effective as, as we wanted it to be. And our uh, long-term uh, plans in, in humans is to, um, is to give the, um, uh, the gene intracoronary. Um, and then um, our clinical targets are going to be heart failure patients with uh, BAG3 mutations that are presumptive to be um, to be uh, to result in haploinsufficiency uh, because they're either large truncations, premature stop codons, or, or large deletions. Um, and we hope to be able to treat uh, class two to three symptoms. Uh, let me just show you one more group of slides. So these are um, mice with haploinsufficiency because they have a mutation um, in that one allele of, of, of BAC3 has been um, has been deleted. And we did this because I, I, as a cardiologist, I was really excited when we had mice data that showed that we could improve contractility, and when we had transaortic banding data showing that we could uh, include improve contractility, but as we went out um, into the community of, uh, of investors, uh, we found that everybody wanted to see what would happen with the genetic model, 
uh, by virtue of the fact that that's who we were going to treat when we um, when we uh, went out into uh, into the first group of patients. So we created this um, mouse, and you can see that their um, BAC3 levels were reduced by about 50 percent. If you look all the way over on the right, you can see that both uh, ejection fraction and, and fractional shortening um, decrease over time in the plus minus mice, so that by by 12 weeks of age, these animals have um, heart failure. At, at four weeks of age, they're pretty normal. Uh, and uh, between eight and 12 weeks, they have a fall. And then it, it sort of normalizes out around a ejection fraction of about 40%. This is the same experiment that I've shown you before. Um, here it's the purple line. You can see that ejection fraction falls um, as it does over time in these um, mice that are Pablo uh, insufficient for BAG3. And then when we treat them, uh, their, um, their um, con contractility uh, markedly improves as the contractility is falling uh, in those that, that didn't get treatment. So that's comparing the purple line with the green line. And um, for those that are normal mice who get BAG3, um, they, they show no change whatsoever. And the reason for that is that BAC3 levels are exquisitely um, controlled by the nucleus so that, so that excess BAC3 um, translocates to the nucleus. And when it gets to the nucleus, it shuts off its own production. So if, the, if you're increasing BAC3 by your exogenous expression, the, the um, endogenous BAC3 will actually turn off. And so your levels of BAC3 never seem to go up um, past, uh, past normal. Now they would if you gave too much uh, AV9 BAC3, but at least at the doses that we're giving to the mice right now, uh, we, we see no, um, no untoward increases. Um, this is again the, the same um, slide with the knockout mouse. And I'm gonna skip this. Oh, so this is to make the point of what happens if you if you do give a um, if you do give a um, bag three to a mouse, can you in fact induce um, a dominant negative effect? So what we did here was we gave mice not the uh, AV9 bag three wild type. We gave them the AV9 bag three with a mutation in the in the gene. And that's the 63380. It's a double heterozygote mutation. And what you can see now is that that, that um, green line that was, uh, I'm sorry, the orange line that was, was going up and was staying um, with, with, the, um, with the controls, now that it's getting the AV9 63380, you can see that it's actually had a worse effect on the, um, on the myocardium because the the exogenous has really taken over for the endogenous. So the endogenous has been turned off and all you're really making or what you're over making, if you will, is the, um, is the mutated gene. And so you see the adverse consequences of that. Okay, I think I've probably run over time. So I'm gonna, um, I think I'm gonna stop right here. And I'm happy to take any questions that people have. Um, well, thank you, Dr. Feldman, for an excellent talk. Um, we do have some questions, and I'm going to I'm going to read them. Um, but I, I'd like to start with uh, a, um, a question of my own. Um, so, so first of all, uh, you uh, a number in case you alluded to the the mutations leading to uh, truncated variants. Um, seen, seen in the human. So the, my question is whether or not there is any protein actually, ex is there a peptide express or is there no protein? And the second kind of, uh, kind of follow up to that is, you know, a situation with at least one would speculate with a protein that's clearly so, so important in terms of its integrative ability that it would be tightly regulated in terms of expression. So uh, I wanted if you had some thoughts on on you know how how it is that you know half load inefficiency is actually um, uh, leading to to to, to the, well, that that's actually occurring. 
Yeah, so um, the the haploid insufficiency occurs because you there's only you only have half the number of of alleles. Right. So instead of having two alleles, you only have one. And and you know an allele can't really there's only so much a single allele can do in terms of production capabilities because it it's got all the limitations that um, that exist in in a cell. Um, you know the various steps that it has to go through to make the protein, and so um, that that's one factor. The the second factor is we we think that there are that there are control points that actually diminish back three levels, because remember we know that back three levels go down in um, in failing human hearts, totally independent of there being a genetic mutation. So when when the heart with the genetic mutation starts to go in the wrong direction because it's not making enough FAG3, whatever, the, whatever that control mechanism is in the failing heart that, that stops production, it starts to occur in, in, the, in the patient with the genetic mutation as well. And so there, there's sort of two things working against you. There's not having two alleles and only having one, but there's also the same control factor that causes back three levels to go down just with plain garden variety heart failure. And those are playing a, a role as well. And we just don't know what those are yet. We're trying to find them. Um, you know, we're working on that every day, but um, so far we don't know exactly what the control is. Okay, well, thank you. So we, we have a number of questions. Uh, I'm going to read them. So our first uh, questioner, and ha as there is a follow-up, but um, so this questioner appreciates that there has been a, a phenotype to genotype analysis and that leading to about a 4% uh, 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 prevalence. But has this actually been done in the reverse where the genotype has been, if, say in a wide, uh, large population, survey, the genotype's been assessed to, to and then the percentage of the, the phenotype that show up. Um, the, se the second, uh, the, and which would give you a better sense of, the, say, the, the penetrance. Um, I, I will note the, the follow-up question, which is um, that, that the, it was interesting that the, in terms of the BAG3 heterozygous, uh, the EF um, leveled out at 40% at, at around 8 to 12 weeks, and it's not like humans, so you know, your thoughts on that. Yeah, so um, to answer the second one first, the, the ejection fraction levels off, but then will start to fall again. And so the, these animals are, are get really sick. The, um, the, the heterozygote mice will, will, will die somewhere around, um, around four to five months. Um, they're, you know, they, they look ill and, and often we have to have to euthanize them. The homozygote mice will all be dead by 12 to 14 weeks of age. Um, the, the other question was, um, so the, the, the prevalence is, it, it's small. It, it's probably less than um, 1%. If you took the whole population, it's certainly less than 1%. But the, um, the penetrance, which is if you have the mutation, how many of those people will develop the disease? That's quite high. That's around 85%, at least in the, um, in the European study. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, a question, two questions from, a, a, from another uh, a listener. So first of all, uh, in terms of the mouse model for the MI with the uh, adenovirus with BAG3, are there any changes in the infarct size or fibrosis compared to, uh, to the control? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, in, in that model, we were, um, we were giving the injection um, 10 weeks, or I'm sorry, four weeks after the MI. So by that time, the, the scar had healed and the um, you know the MI was the size of what the MI was going to be, um, and so we didn't see any shrinkage uh, of the MI. But in another group of experiments, 
um, we that, that were published uh, a few years ago in JCI Insight. What we did a different experiment, and in that experiment, we gave mice <clears throat> um, the AV9 back three, waited two weeks, and then infarcted them. So they were, you know, the the machinery for making back three was was running full speed, if you will. And when we infarcted those mice and compared the size of the infarct to the um, to the mice that were just the wild type mice that were infarcted, the the infarct size was substantially lower, and the um, and the um, and the functional the function of the heart, the ejection fraction was um, was almost normal. It was substantially better. So we actually see um, we see that we, we believe that there are some clinical situations where you're going to do a procedure where that you know is going to cause ischemia to a tissue, where you could ostensibly um, give AV9 back three, wait two weeks, and then do the do the actual procedure and, and see benefits. Um, if we knew how to increase back three levels immediately. Um, this would be a tremendous dream, and we believe for people at the time of uh, of, um, re of coronary reperfusion um, to protect from reperfusion injury. But right now, we we just don't know how to do that. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, the uh, the same listener um, also uh, asks whether it's known if the cardiac bag three expression changes with age in humans. And has have, have you looked at this in 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 mouse? And is there a potential for this pathway contributes to age-related cardiac dysfunction? Yeah, that's a great great question. And um, uh, the only thing I'll say is that it does. <laughs> so it does change okay. with aging. Yeah. Okay. Um, another question, uh, uh, and I should note that. Uh, so, so uh, this listener is saying, of course, that you have the incredible story, the inc really interesting story, and, and it uh, credits your passion to follow the familiar cardiomyopathy. And I have to admit, as well, as I, I, I find that that was very interesting. I always love that touch. Um, but uh, the question is, are there many uh, mutations like the proline uh, to leucine and BAG3 that are pathogenic in human, and, but, uh, but don't result in a phenotype in, in mice? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I, I can't. I, I can't think of any um, offhand. I'm sure. I'm sure there are somewhere, but I can't think of any. Certainly okay. in, the, in, the, in the in the in the myocardium, I can't think of any. But I'm sure you know there there are some. There's something out there that that doesn't cross species. Right, right. Um, so the next listener, uh, uh, thanks, uh, thanks so much for your talk. Uh, my question would be: This seems to be a very cardiomyocyte-centric view of the disease. What is known about the effect of Bag three loss on other cell types in 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 the heart, uh, considering that cardiomyocytes are not the majority of the of the composition by cell number? Yeah, so that's that's a really good question. Um, I can tell you that um, one of my uh, cl colleagues and a, and a collaborator um, is is looking at that very question, and, and it looks like other tissues within the heart, um, other than simply myocytes, um, are affected by by Bag three and by Bag three mutations as well. And um, that that story is coming along nicely, and I I think that they'll you, you know you'll see some. Um, You'll see some data published on that pretty soon. Uh, thank you. Um, so a, another question is, uh, is there any lung phenotype? I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Is there any lung phenotype? Not that we know of, but, but we expect, we think that there might be, that there's, there's reason to suspect that, that there's a role in the, um, in the lung. Um, to be honest, nobody's, nobody's studied it. Okay. 
And and the the follow up uh, to to that question, uh, same listeners that uh, listeners interested in how long the beneficial effects of the uh, AAV nine bag three uh, lasted after injection at at eight weeks, and and would you need a repeat um, administration? Yeah, that's a great question. So we're looking at that right now. So we have an ongoing um, what we call a durability study, where we have a, a you know, a large um, group of mice who were injected and then they're, you know, sort of being called out and, and evaluated um, over time. And we'll, we'll be able to answer that question in about another six months. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, so a uh, great talk. Um, um, th thanks. Do you have a, do you have a hypothesis as to why bag three overexpression would rescue function in a pressure overload model? And uh, would there be an improvement in function after a uh, um, after after uh, a cardiomy uh, well a DCM and HCM function? Yeah. So um, so the 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 um, the post banding model that we use we wait until there's actually failure. So the the walls are thin and the the um, and you don't see the, the hypertrophy of, of uh, HEF-PEF, if you will, at that point in time. That having been said, we think that um, we have some very preliminary data that, that might suggest a benefit in HEF-PEF, um, but, but the story is pretty complicated there, and, and we're, um, we're still trying to work that out, but it's something that we're actively pursuing. Um, thank you. Um, so, um, is there a molecular basis for the different phenotype in the proline to leucine uh, hypertrophic uh, heart uh, versus the dilated um, hearts with the other uh, truncated mutations? Yeah, so um, people are just starting to look for those things and, and they, they haven't really, um, I, I think that the, the field has, has totally changed in the, in the past 12 months because the, the publications showing that you can just, instead of going from a proline to a leucine, that you can go to one or two other different amino acids and see completely different phenotypes. And so all of a sudden, that's given us the key to unlock that information. And people are just now starting to do that. I, I think the biggest problem we have with, with BAC3, quite frankly, is that we haven't been able to get a lot of people interested in it. Um, the, there's, you know, there's maybe three laboratories in the U.S. that are actively studying it. Um, you know, if you think about beta adrenergic receptors, with, you know, within this period of time, there were probably a hundred labs in the U.S. studying it, and we, and we just haven't been able to get the, you know, get the interest out there. And, and I'm not sure why. I'm not sure why that is. You know, when we have meetings, it's you know we we get together with maybe eight, six or eight labs, and that's that's about it. So we're we're hoping that um, that the fact that we're in best case scenario going to have some some treatment options um, one day, not too distant future. Um, I, I think that's that's starting to get people more interested, and and I think that's for for gene therapy, you know, across the board that that as people actually you know bring these treatment strategies to fruition people will actually start to get interested in um in these genetic mutations i think people haven't been interested because they, they haven't seen the light at the end of the tunnel uh thank you very much so this is the the, the final question uh, more of a technical one uh, thank you for a very informative talk um, how did the choice of promoter affect the improvement uh, of the dilated cardiomyopathy in 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 the model, the mouse model? Um, the yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I can't I can't talk about the promoter too much, but uh, other than to say that um, that you need the right promoter when when you're doing gene therapy. The the promoter's kind of you know the the promoter is sort of everything because even if you get great transfection, if you have a lousy promoter, you're you're not going to see 
what you want to see in terms of, of production. So it's, um, it's, it's really kind of the most important part. And, um, and everybody keeps that pretty much as proprietary information. Well, thank you very much. And, um, you know, I, I want to thank you, Dr. Feldman, for a really interesting talk and presentation. And I want to thank the audience for having joined us for the for the past a little over an hour. Um, I should note that um, this, this webinar is being recorded and it will be available at our website. And I think the link will be sent to all the uh, registrants. Um, so uh, I appreciate, again, like I said, uh, you're attending and um, have a great day. Thank you.